G'day, I'm Paul. No, it's okay, we haven't started reviewing spaceships. This is in fact a new Hyundai. It's called the Staria. It replaces the iLoad and the iMax. And if you're like me and you grew up loving Robocop, I think this gives you some Robocop vibes. Have a look at this LED strip along the front there. I think that looks absolutely sensational. Now this right here is the top spec Staria. It's called the Highlander. It's the diesel trim. It's priced at a little over $65,000. If that's too expensive, the entire range kicks off at a little under $50. Grand. This competes with things like the Volkswagen Multivan and the Toyota Granvia. Today we're going to do a detailed review of this car. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of the review, you can use the time codes up on the screen there. Or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we dive back through my favourite movie history. Let's talk exterior. You've got five external colors to pick from and all but black is an additional $695. So there's a lot to unpack down the front here. Um, let's start off with the grill. So you'll notice the grill sort of sits all the way down the bottom. This shares a platform with the Santa Fe. So it's not really a van, so you don't need to have you know this traditional van layout. And it is just fascinating to me how you can have something that looks like a Santa Fe, yet on the exact same platform you have something that looks completely different like this. So hats off to the engineers who sort of make all of that happen. So a big gaping grill, that's where you get all of the air to keep everything cool. Um, I decimated a bird this morning, so sorry about all that, but that's your radar just there. Now what you'll notice here as well is it looks just like another grill segment, but there's actually an indicator behind there as well. Then you've also got full LED headlights, and then of course this LED strip runs most of the time. Uh, when you do have the headlights off though, it just shows these two outer sections. So it's a really impressive setup. Down the bottom here, you have a camera for the 360 camera and then the Hyundai logo. Let me know what you reckon about the design. Um, it is pretty full on, but it's kind of growing on me. When I saw it in pictures, I thought it looked completely stupid. But here in person, I'll tell you what, looks cool and it certainly turns heads. Come around to the side, you've got a set of 18 inch alloy wheels. I really like this design. It's unlike anything I've seen on a new car before. So you've got the sort of uh, shadow chrome bits on the outside and then the graphite look on the inside there. So really uh, different setup and, and quite unique, especially in the van segment and there, I don't know, a little bit boring sometimes, so this is this is a good way to make them stand out. I did notice this before. So the paint on this car looks really poor. There's a lot of orange peel on there, and we have mentioned that before with Hyundai products that the paint really doesn't look that good, but that panel is just sort of sticking out there. So it's fine on the other side, but sticks out on that side. So not a good sign on a brand new car. Around the side here, you've got two elements for the LED indicator, this one here and that one as well. You've got a little camera there that uh, gives you the 360 camera as well. Have a look at the size of these windows. They are absolutely enormous. So you have plenty of glass house there when you are inside the car to be able to see outside. Come around to the back of the car. It's a long walk. That LED game continues here as well. Look at that. It is a whopper of an LED. Your indicators are here and they're progressive as well, so they light up individually. And then you've got your brake lights as well. So love this. This kind of looks similar to the Ionic 5. Uh, we actually did a walk around review of that. Click up here to watch that. It's a really cool looking setup. And at nighttime when you're following this, it genuinely looks like a spaceship. So more of that giant glass house. This is just over 5.2 meters long. Importantly though, it's just under two meters high. And I say that because a lot of apartment buildings cap out at two meters. So you will be able to fit this into residential apartment buildings without any dramas. This is also going to be released as a van. This is the people mover version, but there will be a van that looks the exact same, just without seats and stuff inside. It will just have a big open space to store things. Now, I am curious before we hop inside the car, if you are in the market now for a people mover, are you buying this or the Carnival? The Carnival has that SUV design. It looks quite classy and blends in with other vehicles in traffic. This completely stands out. So if you're in the market for an eight-seater, which one are you buying? The Carnival or this? Let me know in the comments section below. So we're inside the Staria and we will start with the key. So you have lock, unlock, you have buttons here to open either side of the car. You have a push and hold for the boot and then a push and hold to remote start the vehicle as well. On the back, you have a Hyundai logo. It's a proximity sensing key. So you just leave that in your pocket and then you have a nice looking push button starter just there. So the inside looks a whole lot more conventional than the outside. But the first thing I've noticed is piano black. It is everywhere. It's like down here, it's around there, it is all over the place. So that is slightly excessive in my opinion, but 
anyway, uh, the downside to piano black is obviously that it marks easy, it retains dust, and just over time it, it just gets dirty a little too quickly. On the design front, um, it's interesting because you've got screens sort of all over the place, and then you have this tier of climate controls and other bits and pieces. It is sort of nicely laid out, and it gives you a pass-through in the centre here. So from the sort of ergonomics point of view, I think they've done a good job. There's a lot of sort of hard plastics up the top here, but when you think about it, this is kind of a, a work van that is a people mover as well. So you, you're expecting it to look and feel a bit like a work van, but it does feel premium enough that if you did spend this kind of coin that you wouldn't feel like you were shortchanged. What about our touch points though? So there is no center armrest. There is no armrest on the chair either. I would have liked to actually see something that folds down so you can actually you know, lean onto it. But we do have our durometer and we've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you wanna see how this car compares to other cars we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description. Now, what about build quality? Normally I sort of just shake things around and just see what it's like. Actually, it looks and feels pretty good here. Aside from that thing on the body that we mentioned earlier, it actually feels pretty solid inside. Okay, infotainment. We'll talk about this screen and then the screen ahead of the driver. So they both measure 10.25 inches. And if you have seen our other Hyundai and Kia reviews, this is gonna look pretty familiar. So built into this, you have satellite navigation, and then you can also go back to the home menu here. This is where you find the default home screen that allows you to select profiles and swipe across, and then you have a litany of other features. And I'll run through some of the coolest stuff in just a second, but in terms of radio, you have AM, FM, DAB+, digital radio, and a six speaker sound system. Sound system, uh, not amazing. I thought it would be a little bit better given the price point this car's at. So um, yeah, it's probably just lacking a little bit there. So if you're a sound fanatic, you may need to look elsewhere, but you do get in the sounds of nature, which is a thing to keep the kids entertained and also quiet mode, which keeps everything quiet at the back of the car so that the parents can listen to some radio. Over here, you have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both of those are wired and you can see it takes up the whole screen there. It's really sharp, really quick, very impressive. And this is what Android Auto looks like. So not quite a full screen integration. They cut it off there, that section just tells me I'm in Android Auto, which I know, because I can see it on the screen. Uh, when you click on here, you don't really have the option of putting anything else on that side, but it is nice and sharp and very quick as well, which is good. Um, okay, other cool features here. So you have voice memo mode. I like that, because if you come up with any uh, inspirational ideas out on the road, you can note them down and uh, you know play them back later. But this is pretty cool. So passenger view, if I hit that, instead of just having a dinky uh, sort of mirror here, I can actually see exactly what's going on in the back. I don't know if this is more distracting than it is useful, but I think that's a pretty cool setup. So um, yeah, pretty impressive stuff. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section below. Is that useful or is that a distraction? I'm keen to get your feedback. Let's have a quick chat about the screen ahead of the driver. So another 10.25 inch display. This is where you see your speedometer, your tachometer, trip computer, and your safety functions as well. But there is a key issue and I'll see what it's like when we go for a drive, but right now I can't see half of that screen. The top of the steering wheel is blocking the bottom half of the screen, including the digital speedo in the center, plus um, all the stuff that's down the bottom. It's a bit of an issue because when they engineer cars, they aim to cover as much of the population as they can in terms of their body type. So things like reach and eye line for items, they try and cover maybe 80, 85th percentile of people so that you've got everything covered. But unfortunately, I seem to fall into that last 10 or 5th percentile of people that have long legs and a short torso and as a result of that I can't see anything ahead of me and yeah okay I can put that steering wheel all the way down so that I can see stuff but then it means I can't actually turn because I keep hitting my knees so from a design perspective this is not good especially if you have someone who has what I think is a fairly generic body that can't actually see how fast they're going so when we go out onto the road I'll see if that actually becomes a problem, but yeah, pretty disappointing to see at this early stage. Let's talk safety. So you have front and rear AEB with pedestrian detection. You have a blind spot monitor built into the wing mirrors, but you also have blind spot monitoring built into the screen ahead of the driver. I'll show you what that looks like when we go for a drive. It's quite a clever feature. Front and rear cross traffic alerts. That'll stop the car if someone is coming and you don't see them. You have a lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant, radar cruise control. Keep in mind though that the lane departure warning and the lane keeping assistant, I don't, know, I don't think they really work that well. Uh, they can be 
I don't know, sometimes they just have a mind of their own and, and I find that they, you don't want to have to rely on them. Uh, there's also a semi-autonomous steering function there too. It's kind of in the same boat. It sometimes pinballs within the lane and it can just be uh, you know a little hard to rely on. So not a huge fan of that. In terms of parking, you have front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera. I'll show you what that looks like. So it's actually a pretty decent camera. The quality is quite good. You get a top-down view as well. But check this out. How cool is that? So at low speed, this kind of moves as well while you're driving. So it gives you a little bit of um, a little bit of insight into what the car is doing. And I love the fact that you can even change the um, you can even see rather as you go around the reflections changing on the glass and the paint as well. So yeah, really cool setup. I love that. Okay, moving on to practicality, and we'll start with your connectivity. Down here, you've got two USB ports and a 12 volt outlet. You also have wireless phone charging, so you can just slide your phone onto that. That's also gripped as well, so your phone's not going to slide around if you get adventurous in terms of your driving. What about storage though? And there is a lot of storage to get through here. So you've got this center section. It has a lid on the front. It is a little bit deceiving. It looks like all of this goes back, but it only stops here, and I'll explain why later on. Got two cup holders there. You can store your phone there if you want, so you can put it in the wireless phone charger or slot your phone there. In terms of coffee, though, it's actually just the right height for a coffee cup. And then bottles fits in there fine. You've got teeth as well. Lots of bottle storage down the side too, so you can easily fit one of those bottles. Let's try a Whopper bottle. Yeah, that easily fits as well. You can probably put a couple of wine bottles in there as well if you wanted to. Also, almost forgot, you've actually got one here, similar to the Porsche 911, and then you've got one up there as well that you can slot your gear into. Uh, in terms of the rest of the storage though, you do have another sort of tray here that you can put keys or papers or whatever in a secondary tray here and then a grab handle to close the door then you move on to your storage compartment so this entire section comes out if you don't need your uh, cup holders then it goes all the way down here you've got more storage in there you then have a glove box here uh, you don't want that to open while you're driving though uh, actually it probably wouldn't make a difference because i can't see the speedo anyway but you've got storage in here you've got another one over here you've also got a glove box over here quite a small one though and then finally down here one more storage slot there and a little nook in there so you will literally find somewhere to put whatever you need to store in this big bus right let's talk comfort you have single zone automatic climate control you have heated and cooled seats for the front row plus you also have a heated steering wheel in terms of seats it is electrically adjustable for the driver it goes forwards backwards and then the backrest goes forwards and backwards you can also move the seat up and down as well there is no memory function the passenger seat is fully manually adjustable in terms of the seats themselves they're actually pretty comfortable so it's a fair hike to this filming location and um yeah i just found it a nice place to be seated they hug you in enough they're not sort of too overbearing or too sort of um, or, or sort of don't have enough sort of uh, bottom support so uh, yeah pretty impressive setup for the seats in terms of the steering you have reach and tilt adjustment and then in terms of our reach test yeah the stuff is a little hard to reach you have to actually lean forward to attack most of this stuff if you don't you sort of everything's just out of reach okay second road time to get access to the second row, it's pretty straightforward. So you can either just pull the door handle or using the key, you just push and hold and then it opens up like this. Let's hop inside and I'll run you through the space here. Let's start off by having a look at how much room we have. So the button to close the door is just over here. Look at that, acres of knee room, lots of toe room and plenty of headroom as well. Love this dual pane sunroof setup here in the top spec. You can move the seat if you want to give the rear passengers more room or less room. So you have plenty of accommodation there. You can also recline your seat if you want to. Have a little bit of a kipper or something like that. Now in terms of the windows, you don't have windows that come down on their own. You have to manually open them up. So interesting setup. I would have just preferred to have a window that goes down on its own. It'd be a little bit easier. You do also have blinds that come down to give you that little bit of protection from the sun. This is where you control the second zone of climate control. So you can set your temperatures there, fan speeds, and um, all the individual settings. I mentioned earlier that the reason you don't have more access to that front glove box is because you have this part here. So cup holder there for two cups and then beneath that a storage bin you also have two usb outlets you've got map pockets in the back of the seats with storage hooks you have iso points on the two outboard seats along with top tether points 
And then the seats themselves don't actually have any center armrest with a cup holder, but you can drop this seat down if you do want to have something to lean on. Okay, third row. It is a little bit clumsy to get inside. You can move this row all the way forward and sort of sneak in through there. But you do have this little red tag. You give that a pull, that drops the seat and then allows you to slide the row forward. We'll climb in. How much room is there? So we had this row all the way back and what I'll do is reset to that position just so you can see how much room I've got. So the answer is not a great deal of room, but what we can do, because there was acres over there to start with, is actually move that back to what I think should be a regular position. And there you go, I have loads of knee room there. That's not a problem at all. I've got the air vents above me that I can shift and adjust as required. Two USB ports, one on that side, one on this side, and we have cup holders as well. So look, decent space, but yeah, I'm just met with a pillar here. I don't really have much vision out the side of the car. You have to have this moved backwards uh, to really sort of give yourself a little bit more room. Finally, you have your sun blinds there as well. Okay, cargo space, what's it like? Your button is just under here. Give that a push, it is powered. You need to move out of the way because it takes a lot of room to open. There it is there. It also doesn't really go high enough. I kind of knock my head on it on the way in. But anyway, so you've got 800 or a little over 800 litres of cargo space just here. That is a huge amount of room. What normally happens with these people movers is you don't have any storage behind the third row. This is the exception to the rule. It's not quite as deep as the Carnival though. You'll remember in our Carnival review, click up here if you haven't watched it yet, they move the spare tyre from under here to under the passenger side because you're able to then make a big open cavity here whereas right now the spare tire is under the vehicle and you don't have that uh, space so that is one of the downsides to this but there's still plenty of room you can easily fit your suitcase in here without even trying at all so if you do need more space you can actually just fold this out of the way and it just gets down there that expands the space to about 1300 liters so you can see here that it's not exactly the most practical thing in the world it is worth noting that in some markets you can actually get a, a raft of different configurations inside you can get captain's chairs you can get the ability to fold everything flat so you can get a mattress in there. Uh, we just have what appears to be the most basic configuration out there. So look, it is an okay space, but I don't know. I think they could have done a little bit better. This is kind of a bit clumsy. So we've hit the road in the spaceship Staria. What is powering this? So you've got two engines to pick from. You can either go front wheel drive with a V6 petrol or all wheel drive with a diesel. And that's what we're driving here. It's a 2.2 litre four cylinder turbocharged diesel engine. Makes 130 kilowatts of power and 430 newton metres of torque. And that's all mated to an eight speed torque converter automatic. So that means you're getting a standard gearbox. Everything kind of just feels pretty normal. Now, what does it feel like behind the wheel? Well, let's give this a little punch here. Look, it's okay. I think it is worth keeping in mind that this weighs near enough to 2.3 tonnes and you know, 430 newton metres of torque isn't a massive amount. So you can imagine now that it doesn't feel overly quick just with Igor and I in the car. Can you imagine what it's like when you load it full of people? So I think if you are after that punchy feel behind the wheel, you're probably better off going for the V6 petrol because it's gonna feel a little more confident uh, when it goes to overtaking and that kind of thing. But in saying that, it's not a complete slouch. The gearbox can take a little bit of time to respond, but once you get stuck into it, it sort of just starts winding up on its own. It's not gonna win any uh, sort of drag races, but for the most part, it, it's confident enough to keep up with traffic. Hyundai claims an official fuel economy figure of 8.2 litres per 100 k's. Let's have a look at what we're achieving here. 7.8, so that's not too bad. Uh, it is worth keeping in mind, this has been predominantly driven on the highway here today. So we haven't really done a whole lot of faster driving. So it is probably less than what you'd expect, but pretty impressive given its size. I mean, you can remember 2.3 tonnes. That is, that is a big old bus and that is not a huge amount of fuel consumption uh, when you put it into that perspective. Let's talk drive modes. So you select drive modes over here. It's a little bit convoluted because if you are driving, it takes a little bit of attention to figure out which one is the drive mode button. You then need to press it and then look up here as well, which I can't really see. So I'll flick over to sport. You've got normal, eco and sport and also smart. Um, 
Eco is just, you know, dulling the throttle and, and reducing everything. Normal is just your normal setting, and then Sport is where the gearbox enters the Sport mode. It feels a little sharper, steering is a bit heavier, and it's ready to pounce. And I think this is a good opportunity for us to, to have a bit of a play here, just to see how this feels. Obviously, with all-wheel drive, you should have a little bit more traction, and we are on a closed road here, so we have a bit more room to play with. Tell you what, it's surprisingly good. I wasn't expecting this to be as agile as it is. Everything is nice and predictable, and you know, you could kind of just have some fun with it. It is a big bus, but it doesn't actually feel like a big bus because of that platform share with the Santa Fe. So they've done a really good job of engineering ride and handling into it. And even on the choppier sections of road, it's really nice and compliant and you know exactly what it's doing. And then you have that added surety of all wheel drive. It's more of an on-demand system, so it's not sending torque to the rear unless it needs to go there. And that's going to be handy for things like if you're driving to the snow uh, or if you just want that extra stability out on the road that you don't get with a front wheel drive vehicle. Hyundai doesn't provide an official 0 to 100 time for the Staria, but we've put it up against our stopwatch and this is how it went. Okay, so let's go back into normal mode here. The thing that's really standing out to me at the moment is the amount of road noise that's coming into the cabin. Uh, they have gone up market with the interior and all that looks great, but it still sounds like a van in here. And by that, I mean that there isn't a great deal of insulation. So especially on the coarse chip sections at highway speeds, you're getting a lot of noise coming into the cabin, a lot of wind noise as well. Granted, it is very windy today, but um, I am noticing it a whole lot more than the other car we're testing today. So. That is worth keeping in mind. If you're doing long distance drives, um, you might want to just turn up the volume a little bit. What about the ride itself? They've actually done a great job with this. So this vehicle doesn't have a local ride and handling tune, but the tune that's come out of Korea with this is actually on point. It's soaking up all the bumps and, and the kind of thing you'd expect to see on B roads very easily, even on these choppier sections here that kind of throw the car around a bit. It, it actually sits nice and level and flat. So it's a pretty impressive uh, ride experience and it's not gonna make you feel sick if you have passengers on board. If you're planning on doing any towing, uh, you've got a two and a half ton braked towing capacity, both on the V6 petrol and this diesel. Uh, obviously keep in mind that if you do stick a trailer on the back of this, it's going to slow it down even further. So just be mindful of that. Don't go straight up to two and a half tons because it's going to feel positively slow if you do. Let's talk visibility. Um, you may have noticed the windows are absolutely ginormous and that means you have excellent visibility. I can see very clearly out the side there, at the front, at the back. It really is just a visibility masterpiece. You've got a blind spot monitor built into the big wing mirrors, but if you do put the indicator on, actually get the camera come on as well on both sides and I think that feature is fantastic. Now, I mentioned earlier that I couldn't really see the dials and the gauges in front of me. Well, now it's ultra pronounced. This steering wheel is blocking the digital speedo, so I have no idea what I'm doing. And here in Australia where speed limits are so sort of vigorously enforced, it's gonna become a problem because I, I wanna know that I'm accurately doing the speed limit. And honestly, this would prevent me from actually buying the car. Even if it was the most amazing car in the world, if I can't see how fast I'm going, kind of makes the ownership experience pointless. So yeah, pretty disappointed that they didn't actually think about that properly. So I mentioned earlier that there is a fair bit of tire noise that comes into the cabin uh, at higher speeds, but at lower speeds, it's actually the diesel. Have a listen to this. When you get onto it, the diesel is the predominant noise in the cabin. The engine really is quite noisy. Yeah, and I think for, for a people mover that's, you know, luxury and all that sort of stuff, I think they really could have added a bit more insulation there to make it more of a quiet experience at low speeds. Turning circle comes in at 11.94 metres. So it is a big turning circle. It's not like the high ace, which can kind of turn on a dime. 11.94 uh, metres is pretty big, but it's not actually that big when you consider what it could be on an all-wheel drive vehicle and a people mover. So it is compact in that sense. You've also got a button down here for the four-wheel drive lock. So I mentioned earlier that it's an on-demand four-wheel drive system and you can see ahead of me there, it tells you how much torque is going to each part of the car. You can see predominantly it's at the front, but it does send some to the rear. If you do want to make that more of a 50-50 split, you can press the four-wheel drive lock button down here. Once that activates, you'll see that any throttle applications are almost 50-50, and that just gives you a little bit more uh, reliable torque delivery if you are on 
an unsealed surface. And it is worth pointing that out that you really should only be using the four wheel drive lock on an unsealed surface. If you wanna understand why, click up here to watch a video that we shot that kind of explains that in a little bit more detail. So the Hyundai Staria, what do we reckon? Well, look, the design has absolutely grown on me. I think it looks just different. And that's what we need in the world of cars, different cars. We don't want everything to look the exact same. It performs really well in terms of handling. I was surprised by that. You can really throw it around a bit and have some fun with it. It doesn't feel like a big bus of a thing. It is let down though on refinement. There is a lot of noise that comes into the cabin on coarse chip surfaces and the diesel engine is really noisy as well. They really just need to add a bit more sound deadening to make that interior environment a bit easier to live with. The other thing that I'm not a huge fan of as well is the lack of versatility inside the cabin. Even though you have that much room, you really can't do much with the seats to increase your cargo space because it is really tall and it's based on a van. So why can't you have a better interior space. So aside from those negatives, I think that they've created a really good product. It just needs a little bit of work to it, or perhaps one of the interiors that are available in international markets to be on sale in Australia. Let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Are you gonna buy one of these? Have you bought one of these? What do you think of it? What could they improve and what did they get right? Really keen for your feedback. Let me know down in the comments section. If you did enjoy this video, make sure you like it and share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to our channel. But until next time, take it easy.